Look, I'd like to welcome you all here uh, for this event on behalf of my fellow councillors and explain a bit about the nature of the Copenhagen Climate Council. Our council is an organisation that represents some of the world's largest businesses and some of the, most, the fastest growing businesses, but it's not just about business. We have um, on our council a great deal of scientific expertise as well as great expertise in, in the policy area. Uh, Professor James Lovelock, for example, the, the, the founder of the Gaia Hypothesis, is one of our founding councillors. Sir David King was past advisor to Tony Blair on, uh, on science, is another councillor. Lord Jay, uh, who's recently stepped down as head of the British Foreign Office, is another councillor. So what we tried to do as we put the council together was bring together not only the, uh, some of the most powerful and forward-looking businesses uh, around the place, but also some of the best scientists and some of the best advisers in terms of policy. The purpose of this council is really to put a strong case that the world must adopt an effective treaty in Copenhagen in 2009. We produced a manifesto early on suggesting, among other things, that we need to set uh, a target, or we, agree, we would agree that the target for CO2 equivalent emissions by the middle of the century should be no more than 450 parts per million. And I can tell you 18 months ago that was a hugely difficult argument to win. Today it doesn't seem quite so ambitious as it seemed then. But I'm very pleased that we set that target because I think it's, it's very much in accordance with the reality that's informed by science. And that is, again, a, a foundation stone of our council, that science is really important in this. We have to let the science tell us what's required. Three weeks ago, the council met in China, had a very successful uh, group of meetings. We hope over the following year to have several other regional meetings in key areas where we can bring forward scientists, people from business, and politicians together to argue the case that, that, that we need to have this uh, treaty in place by December next year. And this event is part of that process. It's really, I suppose the way I would see it is that it's a stop on a, a long road towards developing recommendations from the Council that will be fed into the negotiations at uh, COP15. And I'm very, very pleased to see a full room here today because um, we are still learning. We're still learning how to do this. And your contributions will be very valuable. They will be taken note, uh, note of and uh, may well help inform our future path. I'm not going to have a lot of time uh, to deal with my three key points that I'd raise a glass to in Copenhagen, but I'd just like to mention two. The first is, I've already said, the science is hugely important. We have to let the science guide decision-making, policy-making in this area. The science, of course, is not set in stone. It continues to change. Uh, we've already seen um, arguments put forth over the last few months that really the safe level for carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is on the order of 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Now, they, those sort of uh, uh, insights from science present enormously difficult challenges for us all. And I think what we need is a group of politicians in Copenhagen next year with a real relish for change, who delight at the idea of the new energy revolution, rather than being held back and fearful of what may come. So that's the first thing I'd like to see, relish for change, guided and informed by the science. The second thing that we need, because the challenges are now so very large, is an understanding of the way the natural world can assist us in dealing with this problem. It's not widely understood that 8% of all atmospheric carbon dioxide is drawn every year into plants on our planet. At that rate of change or drawdown, after 12 years there would be no atmospheric carbon dioxide if it wasn't for the dying and rotting of plants and return of carbon dioxide to the system. There are many ways we can buy ourselves a bit of time. Better management of our tropical forests and forests worldwide to sequester carbon in them. Better management of our rangelands so that we can sequester soil carbon in those areas and get better outcomes. And I think the most exciting, um, using our agricultural lands to create charcoal from crop waste. Charcoal is, it's like making a fossil fuel. When you take crop waste and turn it into charcoal, you're mineralising the carbon in those plants. And if you put that into the ground, it is there for tens of thousands of years. Studies suggest that we can be sequestering as much as 10 gigatons of carbon per annum with charcoal technologies within two decades. That's as much as we put carbon as we put into the atmosphere from all anthropogenic sources this year. So we need to be flexible, we need to understand the science, 
and we need to use the natural predilection of our planet to heal itself if we're going to overcome, uh, I think, this, this immensely difficult climate problem. Thank you.